Please join us, and uh, we'll have a great, great morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, I come before you, Father, and I am just in awe and am so thankful for who you are, Lord. Everything is for you and everything is from you. We know who we are because we know whose we are, Lord, and we are yours. We thank you, Father. We worship you this morning as we walk into, uh, into here, Father, and we uh, just welcome your word, Father. I pray for hearts uh, that are just ready to receive. I pray that we have eyes uh, to see where you're pointing us, Father, and ears to hear the word that Hutch brought to us this morning. We thank you for Hutch, Father. Thank you for uh, just making him such a willing vessel to jump in and just say, I got this. I'm already ready. Let's go. Um, and just be able to uh, just be on the bench and ready to rock and roll for your kingdom, Father. So uh, we enter you in this place, Father, and we just thank you for all you're about to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said amen. All right, guys. Well, let's give it up for Hutch. Well, good morning, guys. It's <clears throat> good to see you. Uh, it, um, I always wondered what it would be like to be called in from the bullpen in the ninth inning. And so now I, I got a chance to experience that. <laughs> if you have a Bible this morning, make your way over to the book of Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 is our text today. In the series Snapchats, Encounters with Jesus, last time you'll remember, Jesus had an encounter with Satan, and we spent our time talking about temptation last time. This time, Jesus encounters the 12 apostles. Luke chapter 6, verse 12 is our text. It says, In these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer. Jesus was about to make the most significant decision of his earthly ministry, the choosing of the 12 apostles. Uh, these 12 apostles would form his inner circle, those to whom he would reveal himself most intimately. Uh, and once he was gone back to heaven, this, these men would be the ones who would carry forth the church, its form and its structure. These were his ambassadors. And that's really what the word apostle means, is an ambassador. But more than that, these 12 men would write much of the New Testament. These 12 men would establish the Christian church. These 12 men would form the very first team of missionaries ever to exist. These 12 men would fan out throughout the known Roman world of the day, and they would infect the Roman world with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. These 12 men, all of whom but one, would give their life for the cause of Christ. One, his name was John. And although he wasn't martyred, he was boiled in hot oil. That's pretty doggone close, right? But he was exiled to the island of Patmos where there he received a vision that you and I now hold in our hands and we call it the book of Revelation. But apart from the apostle John, every one of these 12 gave their life for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. The point is simply this, fellas. The job of being an apostle was a huge job for which Jesus had to choose the right men for the job. So before making this decision, the Bible tells us that Jesus spent the night in prayer, seeking wisdom and guidance and direction from the Father before making this decision. Now, this was not a one-time thing for Jesus. Whenever Jesus made a decision, he didn't make it uh, impromptu lies. He didn't make it quickly and, and abruptly. He always spent time in prayer, seeking wisdom, guidance, and direction from the Father. And you and I would be wise to follow his lead. Rather than making a decision and then praying, God, would you bless it? Why don't we spend time on the front end praying about the decision and then trusting God for the answer? Mark 1 verse 35 says this, And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he, say this with me out loud, men, he what? Wait a second, I know you're not awake yet and you haven't had enough coffee. But I need you to talk with me this morning if this is going to work, all right? I'm batting here on short notice. I want you to come up and help me out now, all right? So we're going to get to the end of this text, and I'm going to give you a clue where we're going, all right? When we get to the next verse and the verse after that, I'm going to pause for, for emphasis and also to let you know I want you to help me 
with the next word. Are you ready, Mark? Here we go. Mark 135, and rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he the next verse that we're going to look at follows the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Can you believe this? One little boy was prepared by his mom with a lunch. And God used that little lunch that that mom prepared for that young man to not only feed 5,000 men, didn't include women and children. The crowd could have been as many as 15 to 20,000 people in total. And yet God blessed that, Jesus blessed that and multiplied it. And do you know, Ryan, that the disciples each walked away with a bushel basket full of leftovers as a tangible reminder of the favor and blessings and provision of God? Mark 6, 45. Immediately he made his disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And after dark, he had taken leave of them. And he went up to the mountain to pray. Luke 5, 16. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Every decision that Jesus ever made was bathed in prayer. And by the morning that we read about here in Luke chapter six, the decision had been made as to who the 12 would be. Luke 6, 13. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12, whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Let's look a little bit more closely for a few moments at these 12 men. First off, we have Simon, whom you and I know better as Peter. The Bible tells us that Simon was a fisherman who grew up and lived on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. The Bible also tells us a little bit more about Peter. <clears throat> we know that Peter was uneducated, unpolished, impulsive, passionate, and outspoken. Peter was the kind of gentleman who his mouth entered the room before the rest of them did, if you know what I'm saying. And then there was Andrew, and Andrew was Peter's brother. He too was a fisherman who was a part of the family business, grew up on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And the Bible tells us in John chapter one that Andrew was one of the very first adopters to be a follower of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Andrew brought and introduced his brother Peter to Jesus. But the Bible seems to paint a little bit different picture of Andrew than the picture it paints of his brother Peter. Andrew was a more quiet and calm man. And then there was James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They also were fishermen. Mark. 3 and verse 17 says this, it says, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, <clears throat> John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Sons of Thunder. Now, you know, in order for Jesus to give you a nickname like that, these guys had to be some real fireballs, didn't they? <laughs> now, the Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about Philip or Bartholomew or James, the son of Alphaeus or Judas, the son of James. The Bible does, however, tell us a little bit about a guy by the name of Thomas. You'll remember him, right? He was known as what? Doubting, Doubting Thomas. Can you imagine? Can you imagine for the rest of eternity being labeled with what you were like on the very worst day of your life? Look at this text here, if you will. John 20, verse 25. So the other disciples told him, that is Thomas, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Oh, but Jesus did show up to Thomas. So one day in heaven, a 
2,000 years from now, and a guy walks up to you, and you're thinking, this looks like one of the big 12. I've seen and met Peter and Matthew and all the other ones, but you know who I haven't met was Thomas, but I'm not sure if it's him. And he comes up and introduces himself, and he says, hi, my name is Thomas. And I say, hi, my name is Hutch. You're, you're doubting Thomas, right? Goes with him throughout eternity. So the moral of the story is, don't have a bad day. Just kidding, all right? <laughs> And then there was Judas Iscariot, whom the Bible says was a betrayer. Now, let me ask you a a real practical question at this point. Why in the world would Jesus spend an entire night in prayer asking God for wisdom, guidance, and direction and choose a traitor? Well, look with me at this next verse in your in your notes there in Acts chapter two. You remember Peter, the guy who entered the room mouth first, he's preaching at Pentecost. And he says here in Acts chapter two and verse 22, he says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. In other words, you were there guys, you saw it. As you yourselves well know, this Jesus delivered up according Wait a second. Delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God? Judas Iscariot was no mistake. Judas was 100% a part of God's plan for the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, we come to the Last two apostles. You could not find in this room today two men more opposite than these two guys. The first one was a guy named Levi. We know him as Matthew. The Bible tells us that Matthew was a tax collector. And a tax collector was a Jew who was working for the Roman occupation government. He collected taxes. And after he collected those taxes and paid Rome what Rome wanted, he was allowed to keep whatever it was else that he had taken in. And he did. But he was backed up by the Roman army. So you couldn't touch him. And literally what Matthew and other tax collectors were doing in this day and age is legalized extortion. And as you can imagine, the Jews hated these guys with a passion because they considered them to be traitors to their own people. They were considered collaborators with the occupation forces of Rome. And then on the other hand, we have Simon the Zealot. Zealots were a political party whose sole aim and purpose was to drive out the Roman occupiers from Israel, no matter what it took. As a matter of fact, zealots would quite often, and any time they could, get a Roman soldier by himself and kill him. They would take Jews who they thought were collaborating with the Romans. No trial, just immediate judgment, and execute them on the spot. These were the people who were responsible for starting a revolt against Rome by the Jews in AD 66 that eventually led to the destruction in AD 70, not only of the temple, but the complete obliteration of the city of Jerusalem. So, It doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure out how a guy like Matthew felt about a guy like Simon, all right? And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out how a guy like Simon felt about a guy like Matthew. And yet, how do you explain that these 12 men would be put together with as diverse of a set of personalities and political persuasions and gifts and passions and experiences and geographic location and whatever differences you can come up with. How is it that these 12 men could come together 
and God could use them to change the world. I would submit to you is because they had one unifying force that was far greater than all of their differences. And that unifying force was their undivided devotion and love for Jesus Christ. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself this morning, well, Hutch, I appreciate that little teaching. I, I learned some things about some of these disciples that I didn't know very much about. I was reminded of some things that I did know, and I appreciate you sharing that with me with as much passion as you possibly could, but what in the world does that have to do with me 2,000 years later? Well, there's one other thing these 12 guys had in common besides their love for Jesus Christ. And that was, they were just ordinary guys. When we read through that list, did you see anybody's name that began with doctor? No PhDs. Did you recognize any of them from the film work they did because of the movies that they were in? No. Have you ever had an action doll of Matthew because of the great athlete that he was? These guys weren't actors or athletes or biblical scholars. They were just ordinary, everyday, normal people. And the Bible makes it clear that God loves to use ordinary, everyday people. As a matter of fact, the Bible makes it clear that God prefers to use ordinary, everyday people. Look with me, if you will, at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. 1 Corinthians 1 and 27 says, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Very rarely, if ever, when you look down the corridor of church history, will you find that God used people who were revered in the world's eyes or who were men of renown in the eyes of the world. So who is Paul talking about here in 1 Corinthians? Well, gentlemen, he's talking about us. He's talking about you and he's talking about me. Look at your notes, if you will. I, I love the way the message paraphrase puts this text. Let's read this together. This is so exciting. Take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you. Not many influential, not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses? Chooses nobodies to expose the hollow pretenses of the somebodies. So often we may hear somebody say, or we may even say ourselves, man, could you imagine if LeBron James prayed to receive Christ? What a difference for the kingdom of God he can make. Or we say things like, whoa, can you imagine if Jeff Bezos with his influence and, and his renown and his money, if he would just come to faith in Jesus Christ, man, it would be a game changer. Not so. Actually, it's not the big shots whom God likes to choose, whom God likes to use to shake the world for Jesus Christ. Look at this next verse, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 29. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. You see, when... If you were to see the LeBron Jameses and the Jeff Bezos and the Elon Musks do something great for the kingdom of God, 
you and I would have a tendency to give them at least some modicum of the credit. But when God chooses ordinary people, everyday people, unspectacular people, from whom you and I would never expect anything, when God uses them, we stand back and say, it's got to be God. It couldn't be him. It's got to be God. And that's precisely the way God wants it. Do you remember Gideon back in the Old Testament? Man, Gideon back in the Old Testament in chapter 12, God tells Gideon, I want you to go and fight the Midianites. And so Gideon gathers an army together, 32,000 men, a serious army to go against the Midianites. But God taps Gideon on the shoulder and says, Gideon, we got a problem. Oh, we do? Yeah, the problem is you got too many men. How in the world can you have too many men when you're going into battle? But God says, listen, here's what I want you to do. There's a, there's a running brook over here, and I want you to have all of the men, every single one of them, I want you to have them go down to the brook and get a drink of water. And then the book of Judges tells us that of the 32,000, 300 men got down on their knees, they cupped their hands, they picked the water up, and they drank it out of their hands, while the other 31,000 31,700 got down on their hands and knees and lapped it up like a dog. And God said to Gideon, send them home. But do you know what that tells us? The Bible tells us that Gideon found 300 of those men who were married because who else would have taught them how to drink? <laughs> right? But he tells them, send them home. Get rid of them. Why? Because if Gideon and 30 plus thousand men went into the battle and won, do you know there would be at least some soldiers who would come back and say, we the man, we did this, we bet. Don't mess with us. You come against us, we come against you. But when you take 300 men into battle against thousands and thousands and thousands, nobody gets the credit but God. Judges 7-2. The Lord said to Gideon, take the people with you Take, take people with you, or there are too many for me to give to the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel, what, boast over me, saying, my hand has saved me. Isaiah 42, 8 says this, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carve idols. God is obsessed, as he should be, with his glory, getting the credit, and being in the spotlight for what he does here on earth. That's why he loves to use ordinary people. People like Peter, and Andrew, and James, and John, and Matthew. Because when he does great things through them, everybody looks and says, God's the one that did it. We're going to break through the tables, and in a few minutes, I'm going to come back and wrap up telling you the story of one man who made a huge difference for the glory of God. Let's break through the table, shall we? All right, D.L. Moody was an evangelist in Scotland 
1873 to 1875, and for two years, he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, not just in Scotland, but throughout the entire United Kingdom. And it was two power-packed years where God transformed a huge amount of people with the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was an amazing two years of ministry. But while there, a London paper wrote an article about Mr. Moody. And I don't know how familiar you are with Mr. Moody's life, but you have to know this. He only had a third grade education. When he wrote letters of correspondence to other people, he never capitalized any words and never used any punctuation because he didn't know how. He was truly an uneducated man. His diction was horrible and his grammar was atrocious. But listen to what one London paper said about Mr. Moody, and I quote, Mr. Moody is the only man alive who could pronounce the word Jerusalem in two syllables. Mr. Moody is so uncouth, so uneducated, so brutish and uncultured that his success can only be attributed to God alone. And do you know what Mr. Moody said when someone read that article to him? Mr. Moody said, amen, that's exactly as it should be. Now, here's the point, guys. If you and I want to use our lives for the glory of Jesus Christ, to build his kingdom, you don't have to be rich. You don't have to be talented. You don't have to be handsome. You don't have to be brilliant. You don't have to be a jock. You don't have to be a movie star. You just need to be you, an ordinary person with ordinary skills and ordinary capacities. And if you are an ordinary person, you are a perfect candidate for God to use in an extraordinary way. Because it's all about personal dedication and surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. And D.L. Moody was a subordinary person whom God used in an extraordinary way. Now, what you don't know is that in 1872, before he went to Scotland, Moody was in an all-night prayer meeting with some friends. The next morning, he was sitting on a park bench with a fellow evangelist named Henry Varley. And just offhandedly, Varley said to Mr. Moody, and I quote, Moody, the world has yet to see what God will do with a man who is fully consecrated to him. You see, those were words that breathed life into Moody because personally he was struggling with his inadequacy to preach and proclaim the gospel to which God had called him to teach. Did you know that D.L. Moody's own home church would not allow him to speak to adults? They they closed him in to only teaching children. But did you know that as he taught his Sunday school class, his biography tells us that he would many times afterwards be in tears at the ridicule of the children towards him as he taught the class? Yet one week later, after hearing what Mr. Varney said, D.L. Moody said this, and I quote, Varley said, any man. Varley didn't say that man had to be educated or brilliant or anything else. Just a man. Well, by the Holy Spirit in me, Moody said, I aim to be that man, end quote. And D.L. Moody went on to be the greatest evangelist that the church has ever known since the Apostle Paul. In fact, in his biography, it reads, and I quote, D.L. Moody was personally responsible for reducing the population of hell by one million souls. The point here is this. Moody positioned himself so that God could use him. He wasn't ordinary in his speech. He wasn't ordinary in his diction. He wasn't ordinary in his education. But he was extraordinary in his surrender and in his consecration and in his full-out dedication to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And in so doing, he positioned himself so that God could use him. And God will use you and me if we will place ourselves in 100% surrender without hesitation and without reservation. And God's call to you and me this day is although we are ordinary men, we serve an extraordinary God whom when he fills us with his spirit and we are surrendered to his will, you and I will be staggered at what God will do through you and through me. As followers of Jesus Christ, the challenge today, gentlemen, is to look ourselves in the mirror, give ourselves an honest evaluation, and whatever we have, as best we know how, we take it and we place it in our master's hand because little becomes much when we place it in the master's hand. Commitment, dedication, surrender. Give that to Jesus and you'll be amazed at what he'll do through you. D.O. Moody's son, Paul Moody, said this, and I quote, to the day of his death, my father never ceased to wonder at the use God had made of him despite his handicaps. Guys, I was thinking about this yesterday as I took my grandson, who's about 18, 19 months old, to the park. And I strapped him in what they call a car seat. I think it's a preparation class to become a NASCAR driver. <laughs> because you see, guys, I grew up in a day when they said child seat, that was the ledge behind the back seat where you would take a nap when you were going somewhere. I grew up in a day when you sat in the front seat and you didn't become a man until you had gone face first into that metal uh, console at least two or three times and you knew how to brace yourself. And I can remember as a kid learning how to drive. I mean, when I say kid, I'm talking 10 and 11 because that's when we learned how to drive. Farm equipment, tractors. The very first car I ever drove was an AMC Rambler. I don't know if you've ever, you know what that's like. And you know what the beauty of this machine was? Four doors white and it had three on the tree. Do you know what that is, guys? I can still remember that. You say, Hutch, we have a rambler outside for you. We'd like for you to drive it away as a gift prize. Yeah, I'm going to sit there. I'm going to push the clutch in. And I'm going to pull it back to me. And I'm going to go up because that's where reverse is. And I'm going to back out of that parking space. And I'm going to slide it down to first. And then I'm going to shift it up to second. And I'm going down to third. And I'm down the road. But that Rambler didn't have power steering. And although I was not as big then as I am now, I could do it, but it was kind of hard. But my dad was in construction, and he had a six-wheel dump truck. Not a ten-wheeler, a six-wheeler. And when I would sit in that truck, and my dad asked me to move it, that steering wheel was huge. And I could have taken any two of you fellows and myself and tried to turn that steering wheel and we would all get a hernia trying to do it and we still wouldn't turn the wheel. Oh, but fellas, listen, I learned a secret. When you shifted that puppy into first and you started to move, you could take that big old steering wheel with one hand, usually had a knob on it too, you know what I'm saying? And you could turn that puppy, you could back that thing up, and you could go forward, and you could steer it to go wherever you wanted. Gentlemen, today, God is asking you to put it in gear and let him steer you where he wants you to go.
Father in heaven, if you would use 12 ordinary ragtag guys like the apostles to change the world, what could you do through the men in this room today if we were surrendered, sold out, and committed to you and only you? The world would never be the same again. Oh, but Father, what would the world be like today? How much would the population of hell be reduced if in the course of this day, we allow you to steer us to where you want us to go. We allow you to give us the words to say. If we allow you to use these hands and these feet to be your hands and your feet, the world will never, ever, ever, ever be the same. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you use ordinary people like Peter and Andrew and James and John and Bill and Jeff and Scott and Bob and Hutch. And may we be those men, ordinary in who we are, but extraordinary in our surrender to you. In Jesus' name, amen.